We're turning to Ezekiel chapter 38, please. And in these two chapters, we shall be for some time deciphering the word of God and looking what God says to us. Very, very neglected chapters of scripture. And I want you to read them, read the words very carefully uh, as we read from verses 1 to 9. If you haven't your Bible with you, somebody might share. And if not, then just listen to the word of God that we read together. And, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, that is unto Ezekiel, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophecy against him. And say, and this is the first thing the Lord said, and this we'll see as a person he's speaking to. And say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee. O Gog, the chief, chief priest of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Let me stop a wee moment. Ezekiel couldn't say that they'd come in tanks. <laughs> he couldn't say that they'd come with the latest missiles. He had to speak in the language of the day he lived in. And uh, verse 5 says, here's who's coming. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, with them, all of them, with shields and helmets, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, and all the bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare thyself, thou, and all thy companies that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. And I want you to notice that. The latter years. These are the years we are in at this moment. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste. But it is brought forth out of the nation and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Of course, we know Israel's back in the land from 1948. Verse 9, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Now that's as far as we're going to read tonight. We're just doing a an introduction tonight, a wee bit of a few nuggets of truth, and then in future nights we'll be opening up properly uh, these chapters of Ezekiel 38. Most, if not all of you tonight, were asked to name some of the wars that took place in this century. And I'm sure you'd probably start with the Maybe the First and Second World War, or the war, war of Independence in Ireland, or the Korea War in the 50s, or the Vietnam War in the 70s. And many of you remember the Falklands War in Bosnia, the invasion of Iraq in Q8 and Afghanistan. But how many of us here tonight listening and those that are watching and I'm throwing this in here as a challenge to those who are uh, Christians that read their Bible how many of you know and have heard and studied the war of Gog and Magog that hasn't took place yet that's the Islamic Russian Israeli war 
as called by many Ezekiel's war. 2,600 years ago, as the prophet Ezekiel was in captivity in Babylon at the river Cherber, as he sat there, God spoke to him. And he gave him so many different visions. They, they, they were in turmoil. He did hung their harps up on the willows and they were defeated and distressed because the Nebuchadnezzar had taken them from their land and the temple was down and the, the vessels were taken out of the temple and Daniel and the three Hebrew children and many more thousands were taken into the Babylonish captivity and they tried to mock them, the Babylonians, and asked them to sing. And they said, how can we sing a song in a strange, the Lord's song in a strange land? So the, the harps were on the willows. They were, they, were in, they were in distress. But in that dark hour, and often let me say to you, when things are dark and things are gone and doesn't seem to be much hope, God can speak. And he spoke to Ezekiel, very plain, plainly, it says, and very expressly, and he showed him so many things, and this is some of them here that he showed him tonight. He showed him about a war that was yet to come, and has yet to come as far as we're concerned. He showed him about a war that never was a war like it, and there never will be until the Battle of Armageddon. And I want to say to you tonight, don't get the Battle of Armageddon and Ezekiel's war mixed up, because if you do, you're in trouble. You know, I thank God that I had a privilege of, as a young man after I got converted 50 years ago, I, I had the privilege to sit under prophetical preachers. And I'll be ever eternally grateful for them, men like Willie Mullen and Hedley Murphy and even Robert Hewitt, who's still living, Sam Gordon, and tapes and books of Dwight Pentecost and Tatford and Ironside and Dehan many men, men that had an insight into the eschatological truths of the Bible of things that were going to happen by praying over and deciphering the Word of God, men that understood and believed the Bible and preached it when nobody would have believed a thing that they were saying. Those men way back in, 19, in the 70s said things that you would have never even thought and they're all, every one of them, coming to pass. Now, the rejuvenation of Russia, and you're watching it every day now, and the building up of their military arsenals, especially their nu nuclear artillery, plus the training with the uh, maneuvers and training with Syria, Iran, China, and Turkey. Now, seeing all these things come to pass, it should give us an interest to get into the Word of God and into the Bible and to read. It should provoke us to study the Scriptures because nothing can happen outside the will of God, and God has a plan, and that plan set out in this book. And that's why you're here tonight to hear that. You know, I am told... And I have never tried to vary this fact. I am told that Russia is the only full, complete, atheistic nation in the world. All other nations, every one of them, are in some way or another polyistic nations. That is... They worship many gods. But these people that Russia is aligned with here are all Muslim nations. There's nine coalition, about nine coalition armies invading Israel at the time they invade them, along with Russia leading the way. And I, I was thinking today, you let hundreds, 100,000 more Muslims and 100,000 atheists into Israel and they'll, if they can, only God steps in the way, they'll devour them. Can I say along with 38 and 39 of Ezekiel, Psalm 83 mentions this war as well. Going back to the fact that 
and, and because Russia is so much in the news this day, these days, uh, and they're so built up in, the, in a very short time, and they're preparing for battle, and they're preparing for war in Europe at the moment, seeing that is all happening, I need to just uh, say another wee thing or two about their atheism. Because an ungodly, God-forsaken nation can do anything they like. And I was thinking today of uh, what Winston Churchill said, that the, they were a riddle wrapped in the mystery and sign an enigma. Their conscience are seared, their morals are nil, and their works are evil. Rube Goldenberg drew a caricature of the ex-Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, and he called him the man, upside down, the upside-down philosopher, who calls, I'm just reading what, I wrote, what, he, what he wrote, he calls black white and white black and cold hot and hot cold, and yes, no, and no, yes. Sounds like some of our boys today. That he was unreasonable and insane. I'm just painting a picture now so you get into your mind when you see those Russian soldiers and you hear this what's going on in the day. I want you to get into your mind the sort of an ungodly nation that's going to invade Israel. When the first Sputnik went up in, in the 60s, Russia's first Sputnik, Stalin said these words. He says, we have wiped out the Caesars. Now we'll see if there's a God in heaven. And after a few days, his voice crackled over the world radio. He said, our rocket has bypassed the moon and we're nearing the sun and there's no sign of God. We have turned out the lights from heaven and no man will switch them on again. We have broke the yoke of the gospel and the opiate of the masses. Joseph Stalin, they say, killed millions of people in the Russian Revolution. Well, Joseph Stalin is gone. He died on the 1st of March, 1953. And his own daughter, and I read today what his own daughter said that he watched him dying. I watched him dying, screaming and choking. Now, I can hear some of you saying, we didn't come here for a lecture on Russia or a lecture on Israel or a lecture on, but we have come here tonight, and you have come here tonight because you're interested. But I'm only painting a picture, and I'm going to show you these Muslim nations another night what, 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 what the world is up against and what's going on behind the scenes, all manipulating, all together, all out of a Semitic hatred for the Jews. It's boiling up. My friend, things are boiling. One soldier on the front of, of Ukraine, one soldier on the Russian front makes one mistake. Some of these days or some of these nights, we're blown into a war the like we've never seen. It's a time bomb. Time bomb. Now, to help us to work our way through this, and this is a powerful, exciting prophecy, I want to set before you five headings, and from those five headings, we'll be drawing what we're going to say in the nights that lie ahead. We'll maybe get the first one touched on tonight, maybe into the second, we don't know. That's why I want to get started at night at five past eight if we can, to leave plenty of time for prayer. Now, I'm going to give you five headings, and if you want to listen to them or take them down, whatever you like. First of all, there's a personal identification of a man. There's a personal, I'll show you now in a minute, there's a personal identification of the man that's going to lead this coalition of evil, wicked men into Israel. He's identified here very clearly. Then there's the ge geographical location. And we're going to see the geography of the thing and where it is. And then there's the political coalition. Verses 5 and 6 tells us there, boy, where they come from, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, we'll be doing all those. That's the coalition that's going to come. And then there's the Semitical motivation. 
You know, the motivation may be oil and gas, and so it is, and uranium, and the assets of the Dead Sea, which has more uranium and more stuff in it than all the world put together, and the silver and the gold and the oil that they found lately, more oil over in the Haifa district of Israel. They're going for the goods, and this chapter tells us they're going for the cattle, which that was the word that used. They're going for the business. They're going for the money. They're going for the gas. They're going for the oil. But the motivation behind it all is Semitic. It's a hatred for the Jews. And lastly, there's a national annihilation. It's not the Israeli army that's going to wipe out Russia and the coalition. It's God. It's God. God will draw them all in. It says he with hooks in their jaws. He'll draw them all into the land of Israel. And he'll destroy them. He'll destroy them. There'll be one left out of every six. It'll take them seven days burying the dead. There'll be several, several million corpses. And it'll take them seven years burning all the artillery. That's what this word tells me. I believe the word. Now I want you to cast your eyes on chapter 38 and verse 1. And let us go a wee bit deeper into this story tonight. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, many, many, many times I have lost count of the times that Ezekiel is called the son of man. He was only a man, you know. He was only a man. And we're only men. We're all only men. Best of men or men at the best. He was only a man. But God was speaking to him. And I tell you, when God starts to speak to a man... Do you know anything about God speaking to you? Do you, know, do you know anything about God speaking to you about your sin maybe? Have you ever sat alone and just contemplated and, uh, and God, the Spirit of God, ministering to your heart about something you did or something you shouldn't have did, done or something else? Boy, it's a wonderful thing God speaks to man. And he does through his Spirit. Oh, God is alive and God is a speaking God. But here we have 2,600 years ago, God speaking to a man at the bank of a river. And he's going to show this man things to come. Things that he would not have understood. Things that we can hardly understand today. Things that I heard those men preaching about years and years ago about the Russian invasion. I heard them preaching about the common market and about all these things that have all come to pass, every one of them. See, God's a way ahead of us. He knows the beginning from the end. And to this fellow Ezekiel, Ezekiel means the strength of God. The first part of El is God, Ezekiel is strength. He needed strength. God was going to give him strength that he might bring the word of God. So he says in verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto him and said, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. Set thy face against Gog. Now, this, this is a personal identification, not, not of land, not of a portion of ground. Not, this is a personal identification of a man. And you have it, first of all, in that verse, verse 2. Then if you have your Bible, and I hope you have, and you have it open with you, look then at verse 3. Again in verse 3, I am against the O Gog, and then he tells him who he is. And then verse 14, if you want to look at verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophecies say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord. And verse 16, you have it again at the end of verse 16, O Gog. You have it again in verse 18. Now we're establishing that God is speaking to a man, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come. 39, uh, chapter 39 and verse 1, you have it twice, Gog and Gog. 
So you have it twice. So I'm identifying to you that God is speaking to a man, a man and his God. God is speaking to God. It's very clear, very, very plain and very clear. Now, the word God translated, and all scholars that I read agree with this, that the word God means the man at the top. It actually means the, the roof. And various translations translate this as the man at the top, a leader, the ruler, and a general, somebody has called him, somebody has called him a president, someone that's ruling over all that's going on. Top ruler. Now, you don't have to put your mind, I'm not saying now it's Putin. Don't go home and say that I said that this is Putin. It may well be. It may well be him. But there's a ruler, and I'm going to show you where this ruler is. There's a ruler, there's a president, there's a man in charge, there's a man at the top in complete and utter control, as far as physical things are concerned, of what is going on. Now, twice it says in verse 1 and 2, he's a chief prince. Now, look at that again. You must get the scripture for yourself. In verse, in verse 2, it says, Son of man, set thy face against the land of God, the chief prince. And again in the end of verse 3, it is the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, you just let that sink in now. Vernon McGee calls him a dictator here. Now hold on to this. Not only do we know that he's a person, we know also, and I pointed out when we were reading, that he'll not appear to the latter times. So we're building up a picture now. But then look at 38 and verse 8, and you'll see that God is against him. Or first of all, rather you'll see that it's the latter years. 38 and verse 8. And verse 16, you have it again, the latter days. And God is against him, it says in verse 3 and chapter 3, 39 and verse 1. So here we have, now we're building up a picture. God is against my friend, I don't want God against me. If God be for us, who can be against us? But if God is against us, who can be for us? I tell you, God was against Egypt, and you see what he done with Egypt. God was against Babylon, and you see what he done with Babylon. And when God's against a nation, and I'm afraid God may be against our nation at the minute with what's going on. When God has turned his face away from a nation, it's bad enough. But to say to that nation or to say to that people, I'm against you. I tell you, you're in great trouble. I hope there's none of us here tonight that he'd be against. I hope you haven't spurned his grace and turned away the blood of his son that died on the cross and rejected him so much that he is against you tonight. God help us. He's against this boy. Who is he against? He's against this dictator. He's against this leader. He's against this ruler. He's against this prince, this hierarchy of a leader. He's against him. The chief prince, the ruler, who hasn't appeared yet. He hasn't appeared it yet. You, you just let that think in, sink in. 2,600 years ago, God's speaking to this man. He says, I'm going to tell you something that's going to come at the latter times. And we're in the latter times. The latter times is past the last days, you know. You read your scripture and get your pen out and put in the last days. In the last days, Paul says, perilous times shall come. Well, we're in them. And that word perilous, by the way, 
And I'm going off, beat a wee bit, but that word perilous is, is exceedingly fierce times. There's only one other place in the Word of God that that word's used. Paul speaking. He says, in the last days, he says, perilous, awful times will come. And the only other place that word is used is used for the, in Gadara. When the demons of Gadara were let loose, it says that, man, that men had to hide. They couldn't tame them. They couldn't chain them. They had to hide. They had to duke. They had to run into the rocks. They had to run as far as they could to get out of the way. He was, they were exceedingly fierce. See, the fear was driven into the people. They had to run in and lock their doors and stay away from the home. That's the only other place. Exceedingly fierce. Mad men on the street. But we're past that. When we come here, we're in, the, we're in the latter times. So we have a personal identification. Now, I'm going to give you, and I'm not going to be very long. I'm only starting this tonight. I'm going to give you the geographical location. The geographical location of this land that this ruler belongs to. And look at verse 2. Son of man, set thy face against Gog. Here's the land, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and tu Tubal, and the and prophecy against them. Sharon, you have a map there. Could you just put it up? Now, it mightn't be very clear from where you are. Maybe it's clearer for you than it is for me at the back. There's the map that we are going to be working on in the next night. I want you to look at that green Mass of land. The ex -old, old Soviet Union and Russia, right, right down. Right down to Israel. And I want you to look at those names and try and get them into your head because remember this. This is coming. And it's coming. It's coming very soon. Magog. Mischief. And Tubal. Now, the only way that you can translate, and it's not good to go by the sound of names, but scholars have put uh, Meskov as Moscow and Tubal as Tulusk. Tulusk. And you'll see them on the map. Two of the major cities in Russia. Now, you just let that sink in. This man's 2,600 years ago. And he's telling us that there's a dictator and he's going to rise and he's going to have mighty power and he's going to muster a great coalition of, of Muslims and they're going to attack Israel. And they're going to attack Israel with a motivation that's uh, bitter and evil and wicked for the hatred for the Jews, but also for the goods that they can get. And Russia needs stuff today. She's the bear. They call Russia the bear. Well, she's a hungry bear today. Some of the sanctions that they have put on her has made her squeal a bit. And she'll handle, she'll handle Don Boy in America. If you see. So we're dealing now with a man that has been identified as a ruler, as a top man. He's the head man. His name is Gog. And we're dealing with the geographical location of where he comes from. He's the prince of this whole land, and that is Moscow and Tbilisi and all of the old Soviet Union are part of it and right down to this present day and hour. My God. Rosh, it was called in the early days, Russia. This is what's before us today. And I'm trying to get you, when you're watching your news and reading the paper, I'm trying to get you to build up a picture in your mind of this leader, this man I'm not saying is going to be him. But there's going to be a leader and someone will lead those people and he'll come from here, from this very spot. And God is against him, and he's going to draw, put hooks in his jaws along with all these other nine Muslim nations, and he's going to draw them into Israel to destroy them. There's going to be an awful slaughter in that. Be a war of all wars. 
And if you study 38 and 39 and Psalm 83 and other scriptures I'll give you next night, you study them all, you'll find that it's going to be awesome. And we're not heading for a picnic now. By no means are we heading for a picnic. Magog. Magog was the second son of Japheth. One of Noah's three sons who were saved in the ark. Ethnologists who tracked the migrations of people tracked them after the flood, Genesis 10 and 2 and 1 Chronicles 1 and 5, if you want to read. And they tracked them from the flood, from after the flood, and tracked them right down into this part of the world. Majogians, they were called. The old name of them was for were Scythians. They were mighty warriors and mighty fighters. And that they came down and they settled in that part of the land. And from them has come the modern Russia that we have today. And the modern Russia today that you see with all their tanks and all their guns and everything else that they have and, and, and rockets and atomic bombs and things that they have that some know nothing even about. Because if you're an atheist, you don't you tell anything. And you watch them boys and watch their body language till you see. And the old Scythians that were the forefathers of all these, be they were mighty, they say they were mighty warriors. Do you know one thing I heard uh, or, or read? That a fellow, one of these, there were special trained forces and the special forces in Russia, the like I've never seen. Only God will deal with this. Saul. I was reading or hearing today or yesterday about one of these boys, the special agent boys on a horseback and a horse going at full flight with a bow and arrow, he could take a board out of the sky. They were warriors and they know no bounds. These people gathered in there and this is where this all, this all has come from. The former Soviet Republic, as sometimes is called the land of stands, and I'm coming to a close now. Ka Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and part of modern Afghanistan. Population of over 100 million. Whenever the Soviet Union crashed in 1991 and came down and they were humiliated, thousands of people went to, went to Allah. They went to Mus converted to Muslims. Muslim. Now I want to come in a wee bit closer before we close tonight to give you something to think about and to come back next night and bring somebody with you. This, pen, this prince, this ruler, this dictator that's in Moscow and Tuba, Tublusk, the two major cities in today's Russia, he's ready and they're posed and they're waiting for action. And all the Islamic nations that we are going to mention here in the other nights, and I'll just give you a wee bit. Look at verse 5, Persia. That is Iran. It was known as Persia until 1935. And then it became the Islamic Republic. This is Iran. Ethiopia. That's not, not, not speaking about Africa. It's talking about that upper part. Where remember, remember Moses? When Moses went up there, he got a wife. She was in a color, a black Ethiopian. And then there's Libya. Well, that doesn't need much explaining, sure, doesn't Libya? And Gomer, part of Germany. Translated, part of Germany. When you're looking at your very, you're looking at, you look at, you look at Germany on the map and you haven't far to look over to England. 
That's only some of these bands that are going to be with them in the latter years with the going to Israel. It's coming. And when you put all these Muslim nations together and you unite them all together and Russia heads it, Lord help us. Now there's several places, and we'll show you this the next night. There's several places in this chapter where it tells us they're coming from the north, maybe three times. Well, you get a you get a ruler, or get a get a, a a map, and look at look at Russia, and look at Israel. Straight line north. The uttermost north, it says, the extreme north, the Bible says, and they're the extreme north. So I, I can build a case tonight. I can build a case tonight from the Word of God without any doubt. That is Russia. That is the head of Russia at the time, maybe Putin. Why he has hung on a long time. He's the ex-chief of the KGB. So I have painted you a picture tonight, 2,600 years ago, that the Spirit of God showed to this man at the river Chebar and told him that in the latter times that a man will rise up and he'll be from this area of Russia and naming the cities and naming those that are going to come with them, whom, whom whenever he made this prophecy, Russia was just a landmass. Didn't exist. Israel was tattered and torn and beaten, hammered down. Nobody would have given tuppence for it. And no, these other nations here that we're reading about, some of them weren't knowing about either, but God knows now and we're seeing them all coming to place. All I can say tonight, and that's all I'm going to say tonight, all I can say tonight is I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad that 52 years ago, one day in from man on a farm, I asked the Lord, I said that there's something better in life than this, this drinking and fighting and smashing. Lord, is there something better than this? I can tell you before I took another step, I found out that there was. In that moment, boy, I'm glad that I got saved at that day. Are you saved tonight? Are you honestly ready tonight? The coming of the Lord draws nigh. He's coming. I'm going to tell you now and other nights where the coming of the Lord fits into all this. You make it your business to get back out and get an interest in prophetical things. And above all, and if I miss this tonight as it close, above all, never forget that we have a sovereign, an eternal and an almighty God who knows all things and nothing in heaven. Boy, I tell you, not one of them boys can put a finger on a trigger unless God allows it to be. In his time, he says he's going to put the hooks into their jaws to draw them. <laughs> They'll not know that. They are going in for the oil. They're going in for the uranium, they're going in for the gas, they're going in for the goods, they're going in for the silver, they're in for the gold, they're going in for all that they can get, their bad need. Israel has it, then they know. Yeah, they know Israel has it. <laughs> but they'll not get it. They'll not get it. I'm glad that the God of Israel lives. And I'm glad that the Son of God lives. And I'm glad that he lives within my heart. I can't explain that, but I know it. I was talking to him most of the day. Glory to God. I hope you're saved tonight. And if you have to go, we understand that, but some of us will be staying on to seek the Lord in prayer. Read your Bible and come back next Wednesday evening.